Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photographer Gio as tonight's guest speaker. Originally from South Korea, Ji is currently based in New York. She holds a bachelor's degree in graphic design from Seoul National University, an MFA in photography from the Rhode Island School of Design, and a certification general studies from the International Center of Photography. Her recent projects have focused on ideas of beauty in contemporary culture, specifically in how women in our culture come to define and enforce the ideal beauty upon themselves. She explores these cultural phenomena through photographic, performative, and time-based works. New York exhibitions include International Center of Photography, Clamp Art Gallery, and Baxter Street CCNY. Her work has also been shown at the National Portrait Gallery in London, Houston Center of Photography, Scottish National Portrait Gallery in Glasgow, Space 22 in Seoul, among other venues. Her work has been featured by The Guardian UK, BBC, NPR, ABC Australia, Huffington Post, National Geographic, LA Times, Wired Magazine, Vice, Days Digital, Marie Claire Brazil, and Esquire Russia. Uh, please help me welcome Gio to our lecture series. Well, I'm very honored to be here because um, I talked with um, Marco and Jaime and Tom before briefly that when I was a student, I used to be like SBA lecture series, one of my favorite things to do, to go there and listen to what my favorite photographers, like how they work, everyone works differently. And it was so inspiring and it's a soul fulfilling activity that I used to love to do. And now today that in fact that I'm here to give a let give a speech or like to talk to you um, means a lot to me as an artist. So thank you for being here. And I know it's not easy to zoom in um, as much as I, I find it weirdly that it's easier to be somewhere physically than zooming in something that's just a screen. So I really. Like, I really appreciate you guys being here and take your time, um, spending your time with me for this evening. So um, brief introduction about me that Jaime did a little bit, but um, in order to really understand my work and why I had to create this work, it really comes from my personal experience living in South Korea. And when I was actually creating this beauty recovery room project, like, honestly, I, I didn't know. I didn't know why I was doing this, but after so many years of studies and looking back, now it's finally becoming more clear why I had to create this work at that time in my life. So I'm going to share some of the images and um, like a little bit of background to understand a little bit better about Korea. I wanted to compare just like size of the Korea, like how big Korea is. And you're comparing like United States on the right side corner and on the left, there's a South Korea, like tiny, tiny, tiny Korea, maybe probably smaller than California. And then with that Korea, we are divided into half. So South Korea is like that tiny little bit of land with so many people in the tiny land competing viciously that it's very um, homogeneous race that we all are Asian, like we all have dark black hair, we all have black brown eyes. And if you compare, and then we've seen this whole, um, like the density of the population is even higher than New York City. The, five boroughs combined. So you can imagine like in the tiny, tiny land, like how many people are living there, like competing each other. And that's where I grew up, where, that's where I was born. I grew up there for my entire life until 19. And <clears throat> let's see. So this one is my childhood photo with my father. And it's a Korean culture and I know like some other countries have very similar culture 
that in daily conversations, you ask or you comment about your appearance. Like saying hello is like almost same as, oh, did you lose your weight? It's almost the same as um, us asking, like Americans asking, how are you? Like since I was really, really young, like my father used to call me chubby or like Pinky Pig as a like cute nicknames. And every time I hear it, like I hate it so much, but it's not just my father. It's just like, it was everyone who called me chubby and like cutie chubby, like whatever the cute nickname can be. And like my cousins, like except my mom, everyone else, my friends like called me chubby when I was young. And I really felt I was like super chubby. Like I, I always see myself chubby person and I now look back my photos, like I wasn't chubby at all. I was absolutely normal, but um, that's how I grew up. And sorry. So, and then I grew up like young was like perfectly like average Korean traditional um, household. And from 2097 to 2000, that's my middle school time where so many things happened. And those three years with cocktails of hormones and all the things that made me upset and angry um, and those things like that affect me is still like who I am. Like still I deal with what happened those days. Um, so I went to girls middle school. It was very huge school that of like total of the students in this school was almost like 15 to 1600 girls. Imagine that. <laughs> and then everyone wears uniform, exactly same uniform. And everyone is like same color. I, I had, we had no, not a single foreigners in the school. So, <clears throat> and with the same uniform and there is a lot of restrictions like on what you can do with your hair, nails, no nail polish, nail shouldn't be long. You cannot like trim your eyebrows. You cannot do anything. You, and then your hair has to be this long, like an inch below the ears. And if it's longer, like teachers would be like, bring the scissors and like cut it like right there. It, when you're like, like 14, 15, 16, like that's a horrible thing that can have, like the worst thing that can happen to 15 year olds. Um, and like we've seen this so unified community, all the teachers were, majority of teachers were male. And there was so many sexual harassment going on in the school for the, to those young, young girls and to me. But like the worst thing was for me was um, <clears throat> no one talked about it because as if it's like normal thing. No one mentioned about it. No one was like, if you speak up, you will be, you will have a bad grade and you don't want that to happen in order to go to the good college. So everyone kept it quiet or like a lot of people like actually didn't know there was even a problem. Like my friends, like they say bad things about the teachers who does it frequently. And like they talk behind the teacher's back, but no one actually bring it up. And if you bring it up, you will be in trouble. <clears throat> and when I, once like I once bring it, brought it up and everything was ignored. And I, the teachers every, like the next day, like all the teachers like hated in me. Um, I was so worried that would affect my grade too. <laughs> um, and like one time, like the cell phone wasn't allowed in the school, but one time like I brought my cell phone it was like, it was like very, cell phone was like something new in the like new era. And one day they check all the bags of the students and like my cell phone was there and the male teacher took it because I wasn't supposed to bring it. And I went back to him and saying like, can you please give my cell phone back? I won't bring the cell phone again to school. And what he said, well, it was summer. We were wearing like summer uniform. It's like a white blouse, um, like skirt, played his skirt. And he's like, he was, it was in his private, very, very tiny, tiny office. And he was like smirking at me and says, 
oh, if you dance in front of me and if I like your dancing, like I will give back to you. Um, like, and I danced, like I danced and like he smirked again and I gave the cell phone back. Um, <clears throat> it's not the worst thing that ha could have happened, but still just like, how can that be okay for teachers? And, and like, and male teachers were kind of like picking the prettiest girl in, in the classes. And there was always, you know, wherever you go, there is like people who stands out because they're so beautifully looking. Um, and the male teachers usually hang out those girls. Like they have lunch together. They are the one the teachers like. Um, and from there, and like, I was like always so upset that I cannot be one of those girls. I cannot be liked because I'm not pretty enough. And even though my, my grade was like really good, it didn't really matter. Um, and also, you know, like teenage girls, like you want to be pretty and like you talk about other stuff, you talk about your eyebrows, you talk about your legs, you talk about your weight. It's like natural thing, but it was with like 1500 girls together. <laughs> it was too much for me. It was like too much of things. And all I remember about this like three years was how much I hated myself in terms of how I look and how much I hated those male teachers <laughs> that no one did anything about it. Um, and that was going on. And then I went to high school. It was a little bit better. Um, wasn't thinking about it, but it just not having self-esteem was just the default. And that's very problematic because I, I didn't value myself. Therefore, what I say does, it's not important. And what I do is not good enough. It's always, you know, whatever, like the best, like it's not good enough. Um, what I think doesn't matter. What I, like, that's why like I don't, I had to train myself so much to actually express how I feel and express what my opinions are because my opinions were never important because I'm not that important person because I'm not pretty enough for this society. So that was, that, that's like the hardest thing I think I went through throughout the teenagers and up until like even until, I don't know, maybe like, I don't know, maybe, maybe five years ago, maybe it gotten better, especially after Me Too movement, it gotten so much better because I realized that it's not just me and ah, like I realized, oh, actually my opinions matter too and what I think is really good too. And during this um, college years to um, before the, like when I went to masters, I did several different projects that's all related to like anger and like rebellious like act like I don't want to be this like good girl in Korea that's like this if you see like the photo in the middle I was like traveling around the Korea countryside and like okay guys pee anywhere so I'm gonna do the same things so I was like peeing and like taking photos um, and also I did a lot of performance pieces with my friends, not really knowing what I want. And, and when I was producing this work, like I never presented to anyone. I didn't really think that this will go anywhere because what I do is kind of like just okay things that I create okay things, um, not, a not worse to like other people to look at. Um, and then during the years in Korea, plastic surgery got like extremely popular. Like in high school, when I was in high school, we had one month vacation during winter. And like after the winter vacation, my friends come with like different face. Um, that was like around between like 2000 and 2003. Um, those times like, it was gotten very popular, but 
not the level of the you say you got the plastic surgery. All the celebrities were getting it. Um, everyone was talking about it every day. There was like news and scandals or like everything was about plastic surgery. But you never say you actually got the plastic surgery. Um, and I, I really remember when I was in high school, one of my friends like who was considered not so pretty, she never had a boyfriend before. And one day she came back with like complete makeover, like complete weed on everything. Like she cut her like jaw bones and like nose and eyes, like, you, like anything you can imagine she'd done it. And she came back so pretty. Like I remember looking at her, oh my gosh, she looks so attractive. And there was like really like cute guys like behind and that, that guy was like her boyfriend now. And like, I remember, okay, okay, this is like where I'm gonna go. This is like what my life is gonna be once I graduate high school. It's like, as soon as I go to Korea, I mean, college, like I'm gonna do everything. And <clears throat> during that years, my, I had two dreams. First one was going to the top <laughs> university in Korea. And the second one is like getting full body makeover. Um, so I started going to getting like different kinds of consultations. Like I went to more than dozens of doctors to get consultations and everyone had different ideas about how can they do it and which kind of method they will do to me and all of that for like several months. Like it was my activity. It was like, I was searching, I was going to like the biggest forum about plastic surgery and reading reviews. Um, like every single time I went to consultations, like I can't just like, I step into the um, consultation, like the clinics and like the smell of like in the reception room, there's a perfume scent gets to you. And then when you go to the like small private consultation room, like there's like some sort of like doctor's scent of combination of alcohol and like anesthesia scent. Like, I don't know what it is. There was always something like very like special scent that you can feel during like in surgical clinics or hospitals. And every single time, like I ask about what are the precautions or what are the side effects and like, do you have any patients like, you know, had a problem and like came back and like every single doctor wasn't really explaining any of those. And, and then like, I think it was like, I don't, know, I don't remember like 14th, like 15th consultation. I was coming out from the building in that very, like, very like hectic Gangnam street. I was like walking and there's like all the traffic sound, car going, trucks going and I realized, wait a minute. I've been wanting to do this plastic surgery for like now for more than years. I've been dreaming about it since I was like freshman in high school. Why am I still not doing it? Because at the time I actually um, like, like I didn't, like, I was like, why can I do it? Like, why am I so scared? And I wasn't, like, the fact was, I wasn't really scared. I was scared about the surgery, but I was so scared that doing something to myself when I'm, when I'm a person when it's like hypersensitive to how I look, that the idea of changing something forever meant, like, it was like horrifying. And I realized, okay, I think I like the way I look. Like I already always thought that I'm not pretty, I'm not good enough or anything for, from like, I heard that from everyone, like to, from my friends, like it was like daily conversation, like how my thick, my legs are, how my chins are like too wide, my nose are not narrow enough, or my eyes are sometimes like, it's uneven. Like those were the conversation we, I had for like years and years. But then actually I never thought about myself in within my opinions. Like when you're young, when you hear something and when you're in that environment, you don't know 
what's your opinion and what's other people's and that was the moment like struck me that no way I don't think I hate the way I look it's okay I'm not gonna be the prettiest person who can go to Miss Korea but that's totally fine um and the second thing that struck me was even though the plastic surgery says surgery hit the end second word I never thought about it was surgery I didn't think about anesthesia I didn't think about blood I didn't think think about stitches I had to go through I didn't think of bandages or anything because at the time only thing I remember saying is before and after in real life I saw before I didn't see anything in the middle I saw the afterwards um in the media I saw celebrities coming out before and that after like it was like a magic wand like I thought it was like it was so easy like I just thought about just the after fact that dreaming about if I get prettier like my life is gonna be so much better like now like I can finally recognize or be like like good person like even um so I felt like I really need to get that done I I want to like I want to document this during the process when one out of five Korean women is going under the plastic surgery and that is our portrait that is our like that's our portrait behind the curtain and I don't think it was right that no one was talking about it like I felt like I need to start this conversation so that's why I started like I started the beauty recovery rooms and this person like she was around 22 year old I met her three times in diff for different surgeries within six months period and the first time I met her was like breast augmentation and the second time in this photo um she gotten full body liposuction and the chin reduction surgery let's see um and she was getting nose jobs and then she was getting liposuctions and this is when she got the liposuction full body liposuction and this one was like the first photo you can still see like so many bandages and like she has to wear um compression clothes for entire body because of the liposuction and this was the second time I met her and with her I she didn't have enough money to stay like book a hotel room or anything like that so I offered my studio for her to stay for two weeks and then first I remember like the first night that she slept all her um despite all the bandages like all the blood and the liquid that they used to take like um, loosen the fat all came out and like soaked my studio mattress and for during the two weeks time I had a really good chance to talk about talk to her and really become I really basically became a nurse slash friend to her um like I was making her soups and I was getting her food I was getting her medicine um but like she was continuously planning for other surgeries and she just she was in a way that she was very similar to me because she didn't really like herself at all like she was miserable because she was cold like basically she was put in this ugly zone that in order to get out of the ugly zone and be different person like the plastic surgery was the only way and one by one like as she does the plastic surgery she, she started with the eyelid surgery and then and then did a nose job and then did a breast and then liposuction and then she was planning to get rid of this um cheekbones she was looking into the clinics and doctors while she was recovering 
Um, and then this person was around like 35 year old and now this become um, most popular, one of the most popular surgery is uh, fat gravitation, which is like you take out your own fat instead of putting a silicone, um, you inject to your face. And this is like the one of the thing that's very differentiate between US or Western versus Asia is that in Asia, like ideal beauty is being really round and baby face with not so much sexiness into it. And so like fake gravitation by doing so, you can make your face very round and less bony and soft like egg shape. And that's what she's done along with the double eyelid surgery here. And she was around like 38-ish. And for her, I met her twice. Um, she also had an interesting story because like initially she wanted to have breast um, enlargement and she didn't have enough money. So she had to loan the money from the third tier bank, which very, with very high interest rate, just because she really wanted to get the breast done. But during the process and examination, pre-surgery, she the doctors found some um, like some stuff in her breast that wasn't able to do breast enlargement. And with that money, she decided to do a third time nose job and then chin implant instead of the breast enlargement. Like for me, that was really shocking. Like throughout this process, um, like, for me, getting a plastic surgery was like huge deal. And it was something that you really think about and like you really, really, really think about before you actually go into action. But all these people I've met during this project, like they, for them, as like plastic surgery was not a big deal at, at all. And like during the process and during the recovery process, even though they were in pain, I could feel their excitement. Like they're so excited because all of them had experienced this plastic surgery before that they know the results is gonna be better and like they're gonna like their new features and it was like pure excitement. And I told them like, I really, really wanted to do, get things like nose and eyes and chin done before, but I decided not to. And their response was mostly their response oh, why don't you do it? Like, what, like they didn't, like I was a stranger for them, like thinking, like hesitating to get any plastic surgery done. But there was a huge shot in the beginning of the project and I got used to it later. Um, also this one is also liposuction. And this one as well, same person. And this, I don't think this applies anymore, but back then, <laughs> it's almost like 10 years ago, but, um, back then, because of the technology, like right now, like technology evolved, like you, it's like unimaginable what they do these days. And, but back then, like when you get a breast enlargement, like they had to put the holes in between those um, implant areas so that like all the blood does like come out. So they had to get this for like three, four days for the blood to come out and you collect the blood and get rid of the blood. Um, again, and most of these photos were shot in nearby hotel rooms where they choose to stay instead of going back home, even though their houses were like their apartments in Seoul so that they can kind of like, it's like that they're hiding place. They stay there for like around like three to five days. Um, so that they can be just hidden and not able to inter like not like not really interact with their neighbors or their friends. So it's like they're really hiding down and before they go out. And this one was like more later part, like you can kind of tell like the style of the photograph has changed a little bit. And this one, like previously, I mean, I like to talk about technical things, <laughs> but like these ones are all shot with context 646 film with medium format film. 
And some of them I like to mix around like different styles. I felt like it was taboo in photo schools back then. I don't know. Like you have to be like I like really similar and like cohesive with the format. But like for me, like being rebellious that I always like mix it up. So this one was like 35 millimeter camera. And but like later on, I tried it with um digital camera that the way I did was I shoot like to make a large size because it's like with the digital like the size was limit limited and to make a way bigger print the way i did was it was like almost like a mosaic that this photo for example this is like the combination of like 12 different images and then i kind of like sew them together in the photoshop so that that we i can do like six by 60 by 60 print and when i do shows i really enjoy doing really big prints because from like there's a, so much power that comes from the size that when you when the viewers kind of like interact almost like bigger or the same scale as a true human being, and I felt like that was like so powerful, especially with my this project. So that's the way how how I did it. And this one was like the first time I was able to. Um, get someone who's male and agree to me to like be a model after the surgery. And this one was actually, these two are actually in 2014 when the plastic surgery industry already shifted a little bit in Korea that now the popular plastic surgery is reconstructive surgery. Instead of making changes, now they've gone like too far that they now like the trend was getting back to more natural looks that she used to have a way bigger eyes but now like she closed it up to make it look more natural so she did a reconstructive surgery as well and also her forehead she was like filled with fillers and her own fat and everything but like she took it out a little bit and him too like he got like entire face like of fillers and and the way that he did was was the filler that you couldn't get rid of it's like permanent filler so like they had to open him up from here and like scrap it out with the knife and she's also the first person i was able to take photos of in new york actually she flew to la to get all the surgeries done and came back to New York maybe like two days after she got the surgery. So it shifts a little bit as time goes by. Um, and also I tried to play with the different format as time went by. So like I try, I was like at the time I was obsessed with this like simple passport looks of portraits. And we instead of doing these ones and I took these four gaps, um, just in case so that I have options. And, and I really liked having exhibitions like mixed this kind of style, just like straight portraits along with these film photographs. Um, and because it took time, like the, the hardest thing as you can guess for this project was finding someone who was actually going to plastic surgery in real life and invite me over the very next day or a couple of days later or even right after like I used sometimes like I waited in a waiting room for them to come out to the surgery and that was the hardest part and it took me such a long 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 time to get just like one person and one person and as the project goes on in a way because this was kind of like looking at myself as well first and also like kind of I think it happens every time when I take photos of any people any person like I feel somehow guilty taking photos of them and using them as my subject in order to tell my opinions instead of using my own body and face I feel like I I'm using them so and also like along the time, like I was back in Seoul, I was in New York, I was in London, I was like traveling like maniac. And 
it was like my soul searching period. And it gets really confusing because whenever I'm in US, I'm like totally like my weight is totally fine. I consider fine. And because back then, like I used to, I always has to have some sort of um, approval from male figure. If I don't have that, like I don't mean anything because that was my life, like how my life was. It was like male teachers, it was like male professors, whoever it is, like I had to validate by the men. And in US, I it was like so easy to find validations through men. In London, it was also easy. Um, in Europe, it was also very easy. But in Korea, it was very difficult. Um, I wasn't the typical Korean girl that most boys guys wanted um so i decided to kind of for the very first time experiment with my own body so what i did was like on saturday you know i'm sure you a lot of you now in williamsburg there is a there used to be a smorgasburg and if you've been there you know how many people are gathered there like hundreds of it's, it's not thousands it's like hundreds of people they're all packed trying to eat something and trying to buy something. And I was there um, just wearing skin leotard with the skin color stocking and was holding up a um, board that I made saying, I want to be perfect, draw me, where should I get plastic surgery? And I was holding um, a pen, like a markers that actually doctors, plastic surgeons use to draw and design their patients before they go into surgery. So I wanted to see and kind of like what other people think. And in a way that I was able to do this because it was in New York, because I knew it, like people are gonna be open about it and people will not judge me as much they would do in Korea. And when I was starting this project, I like I knew like the final ultimate goal of this Draw Me project will be doing this in Seoul, in the middle of the Seoul, that will be like my final project and that will be it. And so the project started, I was standing there for like three, four hours and then walked around as well with pack of people. Um, and I can show you a little bit of like very short clips of videos. Also, um, yeah, this was the, this is like, you can kind of see like the, how it was um, doing the performance piece. It was like April and it was very windy and maybe you've noticed like everyone is wearing winter coats and I was freezing cold. Um, so um, when I was starting this performance piece, like especially when you're doing this, audiences in like complete unknown public that is not in a gallery space or museum space. You never know what you're gonna get. And um, for me, it was like really interesting because it wasn't really about how I look in terms of like, how much I fit into ideal beauty, but it was more about like hierarchy because I'm sure you know if you're a woman, you walk around the New York City doesn't matter what you are wearing. It doesn't matter how you look. You just get so much comments, like very sexual comments. And every time I walk around in New York City, I always put on headphones on, even though I don't, I'm not listening to any music because I was so scared that if I don't respond to that guy, he's gonna be upset and angry and do harm to me. If I do response, be nice and like smile, thank you then he'll come and like, will never stop talking to me. Um, so my, like my solution for that was always have a headphone in so that I pretend I didn't hear anything from them so that they are not mad at me. And this is really sad thing when I found out about Lori Anderson's work in 1973, that she started taking photographs of the guys who's commenting on her 
And as soon as she turned the camera lens to them, they either get aggressive and like they get <clears throat> like, why are you a cop? Like they do run away from the scene. And that was very similar thing that happened when I was doing performance piece was um, when I'm standing there in this new leotard, I don't think a single guys came up to actually write something on my body. Um, the male, the guys like, who came over was either they were with their kids or with their girlfriend or wife. Um, not just like two, three guys together came up to like none of those. And everyone was, even though I'm standing there like, okay, now like look at me and like judge me from top to bottom, like do whatever you like. I'm standing here very vulnerably, but they, I noticed like they weren't able to, and they just like look at with their corner of their eyes and walk away or just like be far away or just like stare and smirk and disappear. Like no one participated. And I thought that was very um, interesting shift that like when I'm like standing there, like they can't. And so this was like the aftermath. And after this performance, like, it was such a powerful experience because I never done this using my body and like put myself in a very vulnerable situation. And after this performance, like I felt so free and I drove subway um, like this and I didn't care for the first time ever. Um, and then afterwards, a few years later, I tried this in Paris. Um, but I haven't tried this since Seoul yet. So you never know if it's gonna happen or not. So that was kind of like the end of my beauty cover room and the drawer of me is kind of like goes together. And I mean, we can, if you guys have any questions now, we can do that or like we can do it after you're all done. Let's see. This is my like after mass. I still have this. I wonder maybe museum's gonna collect it or something. So I kept it safely. Did, um, did, you, did you talk to people during your performance? Yeah, I did. During, in the beginning, I wasn't talking. I felt like I just like stand there and like see how it is. But as, the, as time goes by, I think some of the people came and like hug me and, um, and I sometimes like they were asking questions. So like I was like answering their questions, but I wasn't like hanging out or chatting. Thank you. Pretty silent. Yeah. I have a question. What was the most shocking thing that someone wrote on you? Hmm? What was the most Sorry? shocking, what was the most shocking or surprising thing someone wrote on you? Well, actually it wasn't like something they wrote. Like I don't think anyone um wrote anything very mean or anything but like someone like drew yeah like it would be nice if you you could be like a little bit taller and like draw arrow <laughs> on my ankle area and then that's when and then basically like a lot of people my bag if you can see just like a random things they want to write as if i became a uh, wall on the street so yeah um I think we can do a lot of more, like we might, we will have like way more time to do questions a little bit later. And I wanna show you this. So the very first time I started beauty recovery was like 2009 until 2014. And within the time, um, let's see, you can see like here in the graph, like from 2009 here, it was still popular. But by 2014, just like plastic surgery industry just like boomed. And it became like one of the most important industry in Korea in terms of the economy. Because there was like so many people traveling just for the plastic surgeries because the medical um, technology is very advanced by the time. And the price was relatively cheaper. And also the K-pop culture, K-drama becoming more popular and like people wanted to look like Korean celebrities. 
and like people try to like coming in for the plastic surgeries and they always like they have I think this is a real but one person coming in for example if someone coming in from Japan or China or somewhere in East Asia they come in and when they go out they need to get a um, some kind of like document in a paper that this person who came in this country and going out this person is the same person because they look completely different so they like they have a proof so that when like during the customs like they won't have the problem that's how much they do it and by then like in 2009 the clinics were like more like individual like one doctor one surgeon or like three surgeons doing it together but by this time it became almost like corporate companies of like billions of billions of dollars industry that in Gangnam area, which is like the real estate is like as expensive in New York City. Um, like high buildings go up just for the plastic surgeries and there's like 200 doctors and 300, 400 nurses and like you name it, you have like everything in one stop within that one building. And you can see this like this, this floor is for um, breast and body anti-aging surgery. This is only for the jaw surgery. This is for the recovery center. And this is like for the clinics and aftercare. And this is like anti-aging center. It just like really become a department store for one-stop plastic surgeries. And as I go into the hospitals and surgery rooms, every room, every doesn't matter where you, you are, every room has this translation, put it on the wall in the surgery room for the nurses and the doctors can speak very basic English and Chinese because in the surgery room, there isn't any translator going into that room. So that it will hurt a little. I wanted to show how grand this um, surgery has become by showing the actual interiors of the clinics in like one of the biggest like Gangnam area through like multiple different plastic surgery clinics. And I took photos like when it was like empty and I really wanted to be empty and quiet scenery because you can imagine like how many people have gone by and coming back and like gone by and coming back. And the title is actually coming inspired by here. Can you see my mouse, right? Like it says it will hurt a bit. And like nurses are saying like to the patient. So it's, I decided to do it will hurt a little because everyone says, no, it doesn't hurt that much. It will just a little bit hurt. It hurts a little bit. Um, so this one starts from the reception area. Like my goal was like almost like as if I'm inviting the viewers through the as if your viewers become a client of the clinic that coming through and have that experience all throughout of the clinics and at the end i will show employees only zones where um patients are not allowed to go in and the reception area is the first like image that you get from the clinics and usually the receptionist are the kind of representation of their style in the clinic. Like, oh, this is like natural looking cl um, clinic, then they will hire people um, who looks natural with a lot of plastic surgery. So she's inviting you over and I want you to experience this um, Korean plastic surgery clinic with me. And this is the reception area calls and you can always see like interesting interior styles and they all have different styles and elevator lights don't go for Shangri-La and if you see here like um, breast one there is like breast all the way to 15 and that's only for the consultation areas and the uh, silicones on the display with behind this like very famous like sculptor's work, European style, and just clean modern style with multiple screens with their promotions. And then I invite you to consultation rooms. You go, we wait in the reception and then you go into the consultation room 
And what happens here in here is usually it's rare that you meet actual doctors now that doctors are so busy and you will only able to probably meet um, consultation coordinator who's not a doctor nor the nurse, but she will kind of like advise you about the surgeries and give them a suggestion. like very Korean traditional style. And this clinic is like one of the biggest clinic and this portrait is the founder. Like, I don't know, it's there. <laughs> I thought it was interesting choice and like the commonality of the consultation room, there's always skull, um, headband, gloves and measurements and mirrors, lots of mirrors. And then we are going into the hallways. You walk through this hallways for the consultations or after you got inserts for surgery. And because there's a lot of um, Chinese patients coming to get plastic surgery in Korea, that a lot of clinics had only for the Chinese people that was like customized for them. And then going into operations room once you're done with consultation. And I found that even the consultation rooms, like they all have different style. Like some are very stark, some are very like cozy with a lot of different blankets. Some are messy. And this 360 truth, that's what it says on the wall. and. This clinic was famous for um, like shaving your jawbone, jawline and the cheekbones like in 360 angles. Like straps, more straps. Like I did a little bit of like details in like different corners. If I say some of the clinics were messy, even though they're famous ones. And then you go into the recovery rooms where you can get all different sorts of aftercare. Like they have a full service, like full hotel service and a spa and massages, skincare, sauna. And this is where you get like facials. And this is like not a skincare area. This is actually recovery area. If you get double eyelid or no surgery, which is like considered very light surgery, then you will just like hang out here for like two, three hours and you will go home. So normally like it will be packed with patients with who just gotten surgeries. And this is like, I start there, like from there, like I went into all the employee only zones, like behind the curtains and was able to get like, see a lot of different things through there. And like all these names, like with the stickers on it is um, name of the first, like last name of the doctors. And there are so many doctors. <laughs> so I think like they put it on the surgery, surgery room before. The nurses know. And this is like their fridge. And like they say, they all have like English fake names Dr. Alex, Dr. Daniel. So you can kind of tell from this, like how global the plastic surgery industry has become in Korea. And this one was just like hanging out. I, it was um, like on Saturday, I took this photograph. And you can see it says in the label, um, like same, it's all fat, cause like fat came out from one person front, like one is from the front, one is from the back. And they save this fat to do injection to other parts of the body. So like you kind of like move around the fat. So 
so they were saving it and I was like a little bit shocked like the way they saved we saw the lead and like those in need a temperature and this one also it was a weekend I don't know if there is going to be surgery next day on Sunday but it was just there out in the open saying do not throw away expiration mark And this image will be the last image that I will present today. And I felt like this image, like even though this is not the most beautiful image that I felt like it says in the, in the brown box, it says emergency. And on the posted in the yellow, it, it was like Henry Tin and saying, like listing all the things that's in that emergency box. And this, makes me extremely, extremely nervous and sad in a way that there's so many emergency happens in any surgeries, including plastic surgeries, but is that one brown box is all for the emergency. Um, so I decided to do this as a last image for this presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you, G. Uh, we well, have a lot to talk about. And as, um, as our department chair, uh, Tomas mentioned in the beginning, feel free to send us questions via the chat. Um, and, you know, I will read them out and uh, G will answer them for you. Um, I'm curious about a, a number of things. Um, particularly the aftermath of, uh, you know, this whole process and have you kept in touch with some of the people you photographed years ago and mm -hmm. um, how are their lives like? I mean, I, I know that you mentioned people sometimes took out heavy loans with exorbitant interest rates and, and gosh, you know, that repaying that or even the idea of self-esteem does the, the plastic surgery actually Mm -hmm. help people uh, find a better path in life. Yeah, I mean, like I tried as much as possible to keep in touch and I kind of like followed up with them. And some people just like flat out ignore me like right afterwards. But some like the person who I for for three times in three different surgeries, um, she like I kept in touch with her like around like a year or, or so here and there and asking like how she's doing. Um, and I was also curious, like if she's really went through with like huge, like bone reduction surgery for her cheekbones. I, I still remember very vividly she was, it was like about six months in after the most of the surgery that she's done. She was extremely happy. Like she was, she couldn't be happier. Um, she had a like heavy depression and but she was like, oh, only like, I love it. I, I have boyfriend now. I really hope my boyfriend doesn't find out that I had any plastic surgery and I haven't done the cheekbone yet. I'm still saving my money. But she was extremely helpful. And most of the people I kept in touch, as far as I know, they were extremely happy about it. And like they, everyone, every single one was planning the next surgery. So yeah, but, but like after a year, I think that a year is like a maximum stretch because by the year you get used to how you look and you kind of like don't want to, like don't want to have any business with me. It's remind of their path. Mm -hmm. And even though they agreed to be a model for me, like at that moment, like I'm, they, I didn't know and they didn't know that it's gonna be popular will be shown in different places. And at the moment, like ah, the reason why they agreed to be a model is 98% because the services I provided for them. Like I, like I took care of them basically. Like I, I cooked them soups and like I got the medicines, like prescription pills from the pharmacy because they were like difficult to move. And I got them, like I drove them to their hotel rooms. And like the next day I met them in the hotel room lobby and bring them to the post ops. And that's the reason, probably the sole reason why they agreed to be in front of my camera. 
So yeah. let, let me just ask a, a question. I, I think it's, I don't mean it to be too pointed, uh, but just, oh, okay. um, you know, given what you just said to us, would it be fair to say that the people represented in the portraits are lower income people relative? Did you photograph any affluent people who didn't need your services or could? Not necessarily. Like some of them weren't um, like rich, rich or like poor, poor. Like one of them who had to get the loan from the third tier bank, mm -hmm. um, except her, um, I mean, the 22 year old, she she's 22 years old like who she's not she's not doing it under permission um from their her parents like she even kept secret to her parents who by the way she was living with them um and a lot of them were just okay not necessarily but like in korea the plastic surgery like the difference between us and korea i found that in U.S., it's such, it's kind of like the signature. It's kind of like statement of your wealth and like your class. Um, like you can tell, like okay, maybe like she's from Upper East Side, you know, here. But in Korea, because it's so small, that even my grandmother wanted to get a plastic surgery. Like it's like people who is in countryside who's um, doing in agriculture business, like they will get the plastic surgery. So it's not just like in just certain class, mm -hmm. it's just like for mm -hmm. everyone, it's like nationwide. Mm -hmm. um, here's a, a question from Carolyn Cavalier. Um, I admire the vulnerability and authentic emotions shown in your photographs. How do you approach making those intimate connections with your subjects in such vulnerable settings before clicking the shutter? um because it's these like particularly very personal project and i try to be like absolutely blunt honest with them and the reason why i'm taking photographs and i also truly understand them in a way that like with their low self-esteem and the, all the issues they had throughout their life because of their appearance and through the chat and also I think in, they, they are in a very vulnerable situation and I am there with very aggressive camera lens pointing at them. So I try to like take so much time as much as possible. Like, it, mm -hmm. like for the photos, like it only takes like 30 minutes maximum and that's done. But like before the process, like before the photos, like I make sure like they're settled in and like wait everything, just be friendly. Um, well, here's a comment from Sophie, just thanking you for your amazing work and talk. Thank uh, you. Then, uh, uh, let's see. So Sichuan Liu uh, is saying, did you um, have them post for the photographs? In what program did you attend in SVA? How did you decide to study in SVA? Oh, um, I definitely, definitely asked them to pose and it's a very calculated frame. It's not just like natural, like, okay, why don't you sit there? Like I would go into the room and like look around and get rid of everything I don't like. And I asked them like specifically tell them like sit here, like stand there, like look outside or like do something. We seen the instructions, like sometimes in between moments, I would capture really amazing moments that wasn't necessarily my direction, but yeah, like I'm always like very, very control freak. Like I have to, like it has to be controlled. And when I take photographs in real life, I really don't like um, take the camera daily basis, unless it's just like iPhone photos. When I take like, when I take the camera and click the shutter, it has to be controlled. Like, I don't usually like, that's, I'm not like street photographer that who has ability to like, let's capture the like, this is a moment. Like I'm not really good at it, but I think I find great joy of putting everything in my calculation 
and combinations. Um, yeah, so it's very <laughs> controlled. Um, mm -hmm. For the second question, the SVA, um, I didn't, I actually, uh, this is a really fun story actually. Um, when I came to New York for the first time, I was 19 years old and I really need to get out of Korea as soon as I got to the college. So I came here with, um, just for the language school visa. And I came here so that I can apply to ICP. And within this three, I had a three months um, language school period just for the visa. And in that time I applied, I did a continuing education in SVA. And that was my first school in US that I attended to. Well, like SBA, I've been to, I was mentioning about SBA, SBA before. It was about um, this talk. Like I used to come to this artist talk like quite a lot. And it was like one of my favorite activities to do. And it was like so, so fulfilling. And it was like, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing to listen to presentations of artists that I didn't know about. I loved, like loved or anything in between. It was, it was really good. And it was for free and like for students, it was like the best thing you can do. And later you hang out with your friends and it was really amazing program. Yeah. Well, thank you for giving back. <laughs> now, <laughs> thank now you're you. on this side, you're on this side <laughs> of the table. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't agree more with Tom, uh, Tom Ash, who wrote in that, that he appreciated how you explained this project. Um, and, and why it was important to you uh, in light of your own li life experiences, right? So uh, as an yeah. extension of your life experiences, um, yeah. I, I think we can, we can feel that um, in yeah, the Yeah, I work. got emotional when I was talking about middle school, even though like it's been so long, it just upsets me so much. And um, it just like, I don't think it's, this project like specifically is very personal and it affects me so much in daily life and even though like even even now like I would never be free of how I present myself to other people like how other people look at me not as like who I am but like as like how cute I look um I gotten so much more confident and I gotten so much better but I still work on process it's a working process and also like the beauty standard changes, my life changes and my mindset changes like throughout this um, project. And it's been so intense and you're mentally so in it, you're meeting so many people, you're researching about it, you're reading about it, you're talking about it. And at the same time, it's in my life. Like my friends in Korea, like I thought about it, I only know two friends who hasn't done any plastic surgery. So it's, it's around me and wow. all the time. And like my mindset changes, like when I was doing this project, I was like, I will never, never do plastic surgery, but you never say never. Like now, like I will able, like I might able to do plastic surgery at this point of like 10 years later, like I'm open to it at this point. And, and maybe like my final beauty recovery room image will be self-portrait <laughs> who knows <laughs> so it changes all the time and perspective changes and you never know so um kayla has a, a question um, you just described how you progressively gotten sort of like more comfortable with the idea of never saying never uh, but she is interested in the uncomfortable conversations and the stigma surrounding plastic surgery especially with women and mm -hmm. you know is that the case in korea is, is there a stigma and an uncomfortable conversation that is being had well at this point like getting a plastic surgery and like telling it and absolutely almost like bragging and like revealing how much you got is not a stigma or taboo anymore in terms of like getting plastic surgery done like getting it done but I guess it's a stigma around this till it's the incidence that happens in clinics and it is surgery and incidents happens and because these clinics are enormous and most like factory like and you never know if you know you the doctor that you were going to get the surgery will perform on you because you will get anesthesia before you go into the surgery room and then you come out 
and doctors are gone. And because those doctors are paid doctors and they're extremely busy, they do surgery, they boom, 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 boom. And accidents happen, like deaths occurred so many occasions, but because um, the law isn't there yet still, and we, we all know like how the law is like so slow for our age. And also Korean government isn't doing it as much as they should be because it's a huge industry. They don't want to just like, encourage the industry. So those can be, those kind of like type will be like kind of like taboo and like too scary to talk about. Um, here's another comment, uh, this one from James Prochnik, and he says, this is a fantastic project. The world you describe is so fascinating. Thank you for sharing your Thank work. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I, one of the things that I admire about this uh, fantastic project, as James uh, wrote, is access and, you know, how you found a, a, a very unique way of getting access to the people you were going to photograph. And uh, I think you've talked about that, but can you talk a little bit about getting access to the clinics and how you presented yeah. yourself? Oh, because in light of, you already had a whole bunch of publicity internationally and in Korea regarding the project. So how did you pitch that to the clinics? So clinics were tricky, but at, like the clinics that I approached were um, like gigantic ones. They have marketing department and I would link to the, my website with the beauty recovery room and then says like, I'm coming back to Korea to photographs. And I, I really just said, I really wanna really just document like how the current Korean plastic surgery industries are now at this point. And I asked like if I'm, I am allowed to access to the employee only drones and uh, a lot of like marketing people art really doesn't know anything about photos or like fine art they just liked the names of the publications that my mm -hmm. work was in that they were hoping to get the kind of publication so that's one of the way I got in but the way I actually did was um, in the beginning I had in Korea I had a one assistant and me and her for like seven days straight um, was calling us like a call center. We called us like, you know, we don't know the, they don't reveal the numbers of like uh, marketing department, like different departments so hidden. So only thing I could do was like calling and like, oh, like where can I contact them? Like what's their name and like phone numbers and emails. So like a lot of very customer service type access. And my assistant was, um, she said she want to quit. So she quit it. Afterwards, <laughs> because you get all like hundreds of rejections through phone calls, uh -huh. yeah, and yeah, like yeah. they treat you like a crib. And I was treated that way when I was doing beauty cover room, and like they were like, "Why would you do that? Like, why? Like, such a green look that I gotten very often." And sometimes like I posted advertisement saying like, I'm looking for a model, like I can I take photographs and in the exchange of my services and like a lot of comments, like hundreds of comments were like, are you a psycho? Like it's crazy. I won't do it, even though someone gives me a like hundred thousand dollars. Like those were like the majority of it. So I am used to it, but also it's like one of the difficult part of the process. And that's like a huge reason why I haven't been doing this project was just mentally like draining. <laughs> so I hit a pause. By, by the way, did you archive those comments, those threads? Because I think that could also be very revealing just in terms of sociologically or, you know, at, at the level of how viscerally people respond yeah. to this idea of photographing the in-between. Yeah, yeah, that would be a really, really good idea. But that forum disappeared out of um, fraud. They're making enormous amount of money from the clinics that for the fake reviews when they were doing, as if like presenting like as a real reviews, but you found mm. out it was all promotions. Promotions. So disappeared after like 10, 10 years of one of the biggest forum in Korea about plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, you know, I want to thank you once again for taking the time to be here thank tonight. Thank you so much. And everybody in our audience as well. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. Thank you so much.